Welcome to the Wing Chun Discussion Podcast with your hosts, Dane and Vito, interviewing Wing Chun practitioners and instructors, expanding the world of Wing Chun. All right, so we just spoke with uh, Scott Peterson from Melbourne, Australia, student instructor with Barry Peng. Yeah, he was great. Um, he had a really good understanding of, of uh, the stuff Barry has been teaching him over the years. He's been there since 91, so... It's been a long time, and he says he's still got more to learn. And he's practiced probably like six or seven other styles before even being introduced to Barry. Yeah, he has that pretty well-rounded approach. He seems to think that styles that he's learning now are an improvement on, on his martial arts. Interesting, yeah. though, right? Um, different styles, not not just Wing Chun. We're seeing some other stuff now. It was so nice talking with him, uh, just to like hear his stories and yeah, and uh, and kind of his uh, martial arts journey. Yeah, because yeah. he had like judo, goju, you know, yep. like, you know, some of that. Kickboxing, Aikido. And this was just, this was before even trying Wing Chun. Uh, and he said Wushu with, with a really famous master. Yeah. But but with Lung Barry, he, he practiced a bunch of different styles as well. We've seen Lung Ying, uh, Liu Bafa, Yang style Tai Chi. So it, it, it's interesting to see that. I think that's really cool because that's kind of been our personal experience, right? The way that yeah. we learned. Yeah. And to hear that someone else is practicing Lung Ying is such a surprise because I never, I, no one ever talks about it. Like it just does, doesn't seem that popular, you know, that common. Uh, this episode with Scott Peterson, he's uh, the he's an instructor with Barry Pang in Melbourne, Australia. Check it out. I don't know. Check it out. <laughs> Welcome to the Wing Chun Discussion Podcast. I'm Vito. And I'm Dane. And today we have Scott from Barry Pang School in Melbourne, uh, Melbourne, Australia. Thanks for having me, guys. How's everything going over there? Really good, thanks. Yeah. Um, we've still got the lockdown happening and some restrictions on movement and what have you, but uh, generally things are going well. We're having a mild winter. Oh, I forgot about that, actually. Yeah, it's winter for you and it's blazing hot summer in, in Florida right now. Lucky you. <laughs> so, Scott, tell us a little bit about, about who you are and how you got into uh, martial arts. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so I'm a um, student and instructor with the Barry Pang Kung Fu School in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. um, but, of course, the journey with martial arts started a bit before that. My origins with martial arts began when I was about 11 years old when my father introduced me to judo. One of our neighbours was an instructor at the local YMCA club. And, yeah, it took me down there for the, I think it was only once a week, lessons out on the mats doing the hip throws and the break falls and all those um, components that make up the art of judo, uh, which mm -hmm. was satisfying at the time uh, until I got into secondary school the next year and noticed that other kids had kicks and punches and a few more moves than me. And after inquiring, inquiring about that, I figured out that they trained at a local Goju Kai Karate School. And so I spent a couple mm -hmm. of years training with Goju Kai Karate and, um, yeah, a competitive little bunch of kids we were, and especially when it came to sparring. And sometimes we'd take the sparring home and <laughs> put our geese on and muck around after school or whatever. It was a good time. Did you guys ever, like, injure each other or, like, uh, get anybody's parents mad at other parents, you know, because you guys were doing that? Uh, yeah, I remember not really hurting each other, but we did put some holes in some plaster walls. I remember mean, one of my mates, oh, like a flying kick, sent a, a kid flying backwards in the couch, corner of the couch, punched through the plaster. And that was about the worst trouble we had. But, yeah, oh, okay. Just, so it wasn't even like hurting each other. It was just destruction. Of, <laughs> yeah. Of I, think we used, <laughs> I think every now and then, I remember one time I winded one of the guys with a spinning back kick when he was running at me. Just, just silliness, really. Just uh -huh. young. Just fun. But, um, yeah, that went on for a couple of years and I enjoyed the, the time with karate. Um, but then one of the guys got an interest in wushu, the Chinese performance art, mm -hmm. and uh, he got wind that um, at uh, Grandmaster William Chung's school in Dandenong, he had at the time that he had an instructor from China over, Liang Chang Sing. And, um, yeah, he was part of the Beijing team that were national champions five years in a row, the same team that Jet Li was in, and he was teaching wushu. Yeah. That's awesome. 
Yeah, so we headed on down there to check that out and were very impressed immediately with what he could do. Like he could do a, a front kick that could come up and tap his toes on his forehead, you know, just the flexibility in the hips was insane. Wow. Butterfly kicks, spinning double axe kicks, all that sort of stuff, and yeah, and landing in the splits and a full range of weapons. Yeah, so we, I was with uh, him for about four years, Chung Sing. Um, uh, sort of non-structured sort of systems. It depended on what he wanted to do that week. Sometimes it would be a long fist form. Next week it'd be a spear. Then it'd be a three-sectional. Um, the the steel whip uh, it was fantastic. It was very exciting at the time. Mm-hmm. That's why I spent so many years doing it. Um, but eventually I ran into an old karate mate, and of course he wanted to have a spa as we all did. And mm-hmm. yeah, I just felt he got the better of me a little. And he, I think he was a year younger too from memory, which hurt a bit. So I thought, right, I need to do something about this and started thinking more and more about the combat side of martial arts. And around mm-hmm. that time, I'm a, I was a carpenter, I'm an apprentice carpenter at the time. I was about 17 years old and I had a new boss and turned out that he was right into um, kickboxing. He was a massive Bruce Lee fan and he saw me doing one of my high kicks at work for some reason, mucking around, and he pulled me aside and said, oh, you into martial arts? I love it too. He was, you know, like I said, low th- early 30s, and he was into bodybuilding as well, so he was a bit of a rig. And he said, do you want to do some training with me? And you know, I was a skinny 17-year-old. I was like, yeah, of course, let's do it. So we had these Tuesday night sessions I sort of fondly recall it as the Fight Club days. It was well before the Brad Pitt movie. Oh, and wow. um, we used to just go to his house and just do kickboxing training. So, And I hadn't done that before. So, you know, just all the boxing type footwork, the the four punches, you jab and cross and hook and uppercut, and just combine with karate style kicking or martial arts kicking, front kick, side kick, and we mm-hmm. do the drills for about an hour, and then he used to just put the egg timer on the fridge in the in the garage, and we wear bag mitts, thin bag mitts, and spar each other, and um, it was pretty hectic. Uh, there was a few injuries came out, but I broke a knuckle. Another guy had his nose split in the middle for a roundhouse kick. <laughs> Oh, and, my God. Uh, yeah, it was a bit crazy when I think back on it. Um, I remember one time I got a hook punch and it hit my head into the brick wall and everything sort of went red and there were sparkling stars and he's going, keep going, keep going, just kept jabbing at me. And, yeah, so that was oh a that was an interesting time in my martial arts career. <laughs> but, um, yes, no knockouts. Yeah, but, yeah, and then from that I started doing – I was still doing the wool shoe at the time. Uh, and then I dabbled with Aikido for about six months. There was a place locally, the Japan Seminar House, it was called, and they used to run Aikido classes. So uh, a friend of mine and, and myself, we went down there and just to see what that was all about. And we were very impressed with their wrist locks and uh, the way they tie you up. But mm-hmm. after about six months, we kind of realized that they they seemed to rely, in that short experience, we found that they seemed to rely on the opponent giving them a lot of energy. Like every attack started with you lunging forward, you know, with mm-hmm. the previous experience I had with the boxing. and It doesn't always happen like that. A lot of people will hold back and just throw out a jab or, you know, not commit too much to you. Mm-hmm. Um, so I kind of moved yeah. on from that and kept going with the, the kickboxing and the wushu. And then at work at the time, I had another newcomer come to the workplace who was an ex-Barry Pang student. Uh, my mate Ian, and he um, hadn't trained for, I think, two or three years. Because I was always talking about martial arts all the time, it got him uh, enthused again. And he went back oh. to class. He said, I'm going to go back to Kung Fu, you know. And he did about, I reckon, two lessons. And he goes, let's have a spar at lunchtime. I'm like, come on, mate, you've only just gone back. <laughs> Don't you want to um, warm up a little bit or you know, get a few more weeks here before we spar? And he goes, no, no, let's have a light spar. No one's around, so... We just went outside and, um, you know, I just formed up kickboxing guard and I thought, oh, no worries, a couple of jabs and I'll just throw a roundhouse kick to the head. This will be easy. He is 6'3", so he's a bit taller than me. I'm 6'0". And, uh-huh. um, and it was just blew my mind what happened. He just moved straight in. And as you, you're familiar with Wing Chun, the chain punching, it just didn't stop. I was like, hang on, what about the, you know, change of exchange of techniques, circle around a bit, get some distance, throw a kick, move in, move out, you know. What's all this? Just move straight in and never leave me alone. Just keep pounding me. And um, and then I th- and then I was like, and then he goes, uh, I'll just try it with one hand. I'm like, come on, mate, one hand. <laughs> and then he just moved in one hand, tons out, punch block, jab. I'm like, get out, you know. So I said, all right, I'm coming to your school. Who is this guy, Barry Pang? I'm coming to have a look. 
So, Can I ask you a question real quick about that? Because it's I'm wondering, like, what, is it the difference of like with the kickboxing background, you're doing a bit of a dance, like? Um, well, you're on your toes, you know, and you're you're judging distance. You might go in for a quick exchange of a flurry of blows, you know, cover up, back out, circle round. Like, it's just different to someone who just bridges the gap, sticks to your forearm, and just never stops hitting. <laughs> mm-hmm. I know that's like one of the principles of, of Wing Chun is like um, uh, simultaneous attack and defense and then just go in right so mm. I mean like yeah but other style you know with boxing and stuff there is a lot of like moving around you know jab stick and jab and, and you know uh, try to get around so yeah if it doesn't work you change tact you know but of mm-hmm. course you've got the gloves to cover up too which you don't, you know, mm. you've got no, just putting your fists up to your head does not protect you with, against someone with Wing Chun. Yeah, right. so that's what happened to me there. So I went to the next class that was available and took my now wife along with me for a look. And um, I met Barry and he asked me what I've done before and I explained the you know, the whole thing, the judo, the karate, the wushu and all the bits and bobs. And he said, all right, I had, show me your guard. So I just did, you know, like a kickboxing type guard with the chin tucked in the lead shoulder, hands up, protecting your head. And um, he just did like a little chop, like a wrist movement, you know, like, you know, in um, the second part of Sum Tao, that first wrist movement. And, just, and it was like a baseball bat hit my guard, just bang, knocked my guard down. I was like, where did that power come from? He only moved his hands about 30 millimetres, you know. Mm-hmm. And then he, when he had it down, he threw a punch. And I just felt it flick my chin. And I didn't even see it. I looked at Claire. I said, did he just hit me? She's like, yeah. And I was like, what is going on here? Um, so that was it for me, uh, March 1991, 19 years of age, and just uh, – Started again, went to the back of the class, learned how to punch to the center line. And mm-hmm. yeah, the funny thing is, I'd seen it previously back when I was doing the Wu Shu um, at uh, William Chung's Academy and um, never rated it. Saw them doing Sulam Tao and moving around. I just didn't understand because I never sparred anyone. Yeah, mm-hmm. but uh, I was sold. So that's how, where it all started. Interesting. Then, wow. So you, you've been with him, uh, with Barry Pang, since 1991 now? Yes, yeah, since March 91, there's no reason for me to go anywhere else because there's just so much still to learn. And um, and one of the things that grabbed me too was, I said to you before about the Wu Shu and sort of the non-structured training, um, this was very structured. Basics, mm-hmm. basic stance, sun tao, punch to the center, sidestep. It's just everything sort of built and upon the thing the thing prior it just made sense to me probably being a builder and you know we start with foundations and up we go it just really clicked yeah it just clicked for me the system and i could see you know all the advanced students and what i'd experienced with ian and i must note that ian was only a third belt um with barry too (laughs) and he still cleaned me up despite all the other training i'd done oh wow so you mentioned um at Barry's school that you practice Wing Chun among other styles. What are some of the other styles that uh, you practice with Barry in, over the years? Yeah, so what happened? Um, Barry's uh, lineage is Wong Sun Lung. So Nip Man, Wong Sun Lung, Barry, because uh, Barry went to Hong Kong for lived for a year in the early 70s before he started the school in 74. I started in 91. And then around late 92, early 93, Barry was introduced to a uh, master, Wu Kertai, who I refer to as Wu Siegel, and he was a master of Lung Ying, dragon-shaped Kung Fu, uh, Loho Bafa, and young style Tai Chi. He had a, a depth of knowledge that was incredible. And so Barry was, at the time, I think, was quite satisfied with his Wing Chun, but he, someone asked him to meet uh, Wu Kutai, and he did, and yeah, Barry could tell straight away as soon as he the, um, the Wu put his hand on him how strong and powerful but relaxed he was. And it intrigued Barry straight away. Um, so they caught up a couple more times. And then um, uh, Will Siegung said to Barry, because you've got the Wing Chun background, you, you already got the strong stance and relaxed upper body, I can teach you this Lung Ying because um, it's another Ung Moi art because the, the history, of course, you know, what's like with the Wing Chun history, there's so many different stories and you can only believe what you've, what's passed on vocally through your school. But um, Ung Moi her own art was Lung Ying is what we've been taught. And then she invented the Wing Chun, obviously, on the on the course of the journey. So, yeah, it has the answers. If you look at some of the videos on the website, you'll see where Barry describes how Cup Sao from Lung Ying uh, defeats the Wing Chun centerline. 
um, which makes sense that she'd have a stronger technique for herself. Yeah, so we started Nutma, which is the foundation of longing, the Nutma movement to strengthen the hips, coordinate the power through the hands, and um, started practicing the first form, Saplotung, the six day movement form. Mm-hmm. And then um, with the, Barry, Barry started teaching us, which he'd learned from Wu Sigung, the Lahopafa, which has the Yu Shun uh, solo movement, rowing the boat. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Lahopafa movement, Yu Shun. And it has a um, partner exercise in it. Are you guys familiar with that one? Yeah, um, I've, I've done spent, it I've spent some time practicing it. Yeah, yeah, it's not my favorite personally. I enjoy it very much. Yeah, I, I use it a lot for practicing. I believe it attacking on the in, inside gate a lot, or, or controlling inside gate. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. exactly my right. interpretation yeah. of it. Yeah, that's exactly right, Dane, because the the Yu Shun, like the principles, with Wing Chun obviously set a line an economy of movement. And then with the lahopafa, it's to gain the inside advantage. So they try and get inside your forearms so they can mm-hmm. strike straight away, but you're trapped on the outside. And that's what the um, – you shouldn't say the partner work um, is what that does. You push the person's wrist back and get the inside position. But it's done slowly um, on your own when you do the solo movement. It's what's called the rowing the boat because you just tran- – you, you don't go up and down, but you transfer the weight from the back foot to the front foot in a longer style of stance and you you just coordinate moving with with control and with power the whole way through so you can attack fast but also can absorb incoming force through that movement and then um tai chi as well because uh you'd have to talk to barry to get the whole history i can't remember all the names but i know that uh, wolf sigung was taught um, young style tai chi by someone from the actual young sing po ring, rings a bell the name but i can't remember exactly how it fits in um, through the family. So it, it, the ties back to the young style Tai Chi are quite um, pure as well. So we learnt the 88 movement form back in the early 90s, um, mm-hmm. but we currently still practice regularly the twisail, the pushing hands, both the single and the double, just because of the added sensitivity training we gained from that because, of course, with the Tai Chi, the principle is to knock you off balance. So you combine mm-hmm. that with the Chi Sao from Wing Chun and the Yu Shun, movements and then the tai chi you've got a lot of different sensitivity training right they they all kind of seem to to create one thing at the end right with With gaining the advantage you practice yeah like with Mm. with controlling controlling the weight and controlling the the person's balance through touch sensitivity and uh, those things they all share these things in common oh they do absolutely yeah, and that, that fundamental about what you said about controlling the weight, the body weight, that's one thing Barry always says was if you can't stand, you can't fight. So you've got to be able to have that firm grip on the ground and control your stance. And it's in Wing Chun with the Sulam Tao, that first movement where you open the toes, kick out the heels, your toes grab the floor, you know, bend your knees, push through the, the glutes, through the hips, that forward force. And those mm-hmm. little movements where your toes are gripping the ground that whole time where you're holding that form, that strengthens all those tiny little ligaments and everything in your, your ankle, you know, these little little components of the body that you don't think about a lot of the time, but it's happening in that training. And that's mm-hmm. the thing I noticed straight away when I started sparring the guys in the school. Once I'd learned enough to, to spar a bit, just the, the higher students, just the force they had and the way they could withstand force as well because it's this grip on the earth and, and, the, and the pliable, flexible upper body to absorb and deflect. Yeah, it was very exciting. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense because my personal experience with wing, practicing Wing Chun and, and Tai Chi is that they're, they're really similar and that they, they supplement each other, not supp- like they complement each other very well. And it's also that, I mean, in the in the podcast, we've interviewed other other practitioners, other instructors, and it's quite common for people to be practicing and teaching both Wing Chun and Tai Chi. Yeah, yeah it makes yeah. sense because the, the soft upper body. Yeah, you know, I shouldn't say soft because the way it's explained to us is hard but soft, and I don't know the Chinese terms, but um, Barry often talks about how Wu Sikong used to say, "You've got to be hard but soft," and the way we've um, worked out what that means is that um, Barry has explained to us as if the skeleton is in the right positions, it is hard. It's structurally sound, 
and it transfers load back to the ground. But the soft component is obviously the, the muscles are relaxed because you've got to be cat-like reflexes. You've got to be fast. And as soon as you tense up to resist force, you slow yourself down. So that's what right. um, we get told by the hard, be hard but soft. Right. Yeah, because if a muscle is already tense, then you're not going to get any more out of it, right? So it needs to be in this like state of uh, relaxed uh, like in relaxation so that you can tense in order to produce that power. Mm, that's it. The, the, the legs, the legs, the glutes, the hips, everything from below is pushing like crazy. Um, and the upper body is structurally sound. That's what, you know, if you've seen the videos with Barry throwing a lot of us guys around on the website, you know, some people yeah. think, oh, it's not true. How can that be? How can that be right? You know, how can he just throw you like that? But it's because we're pushing so almightily hard trying to get through. And then he's still soft and pliable and just flicks us off. He, he often talks to us about, it's about the amount of muscles you can bring into play because if you train them properly through all these different movements, you, you gain better range of movement in them. And if you don't stiffen them up, the right ones have to be strong, but the, 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 the ones that need to move at the time are still loose. You can get yourself out of these encounters. Right. Yeah. You still have, um, you still have more potential in those muscles that are loose than the ones that you have when, when they're yeah, not. Yeah, Exactly. Yeah, so yeah. it was all very exciting. So it was a pretty good time. So yeah, we had our we used to have at least two training camps a year back in the nineties and yeah, Will Sigung would come along with us and yeah, help run classes and even help cook the food and everything. He was such a great man. And passed on so much kung fu to Barry and, and Anne Pang, Barry's wife, who's a phenomenal martial artist, it's the top student in the school. Um yeah, and it's passed down to us. So it's, it's been a good um, time. Since uh, while well, we're still kind of close to the to the discussion of styles, I I'd like to ask you something. Um, just be, uh, of the Lung Ying, uh, because that's uh, a style that Dana and I have experience with. Yep. Uh, what is what are some ways that you see that that they complement each other? Um, for me, I think personally, I, I feel like the the Boy Gim and, and the Soi Q are are like really good when you implement them in, into Wing Chun like Chi Sao's. Yeah. What do you think about that? Yeah, is Soi Q, is that Saw so Sao? Is that the one that comes in like a knifing movement? I'm not familiar with the term Soi Q. Sorry, we don't use a lot of the Chinese terms in our school. The boy Gim is drawing the sword. Boy, boy Gim, I know. Cup Sao Boy Gim. I'm very familiar with that because yeah. um, that was Lam Yu Guai's favorite because that's, that's, that's the lineage on, um, on our side with the, the oh, okay. us, us as well. Is it? Yeah, great. Yeah, so Lum Yugai, Wukatai, then to Barry, then us. Yeah, but I think they complement each other perfectly because they still have the the same, um, we call it the nut, the, the power from the, the stance. Um, Lung Ying fights closer. So Wing Chun is that elbow to elbow range, but with the Lung Ying, you come in and you lock the opponent's elbow against their body. I remember Wu Si Gung used to say, and uh, Barry Nan would translate it for us, that um, in, in combat, only you have hands. So basically with Lung Ying, you take their guard away and you can see that oh. with Cup Sao, Saw Sao, you know, all these movements where the first thing you do is disable their guard and then you have the, um, it's called Cup Sao Ding John, that, that, that slap, that you know, that one that, in, it's like the second last move in Sap Luk Dung, you know, that one where you Cup Sao and palm thrust and it just smashes in, the, in the, to the face with the palm but the fingers flick to the eyes. It's a very effective technique. So yeah, only cup, you have hands. So, is that the one? <laughs> it's oh, so yeah. funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cup yeah. yeah, we have. Yeah. And, and a lot of the, the technique, I believe, we call is more, uh, more Q. Or more oh, I haven't, I haven't learned that yet. I mean, we so, have. Diff- I mean, sure, there's di- different. I'm just saying, it's Devito. Uh, <laughs> just okay, so you yeah. know the, the familiar what he's talking about. It's controlling the bridge with with more cup and uh, Lung Ying. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So that's how I say that they complement each other because. The Lung Ying is when you need to go even closer. You've pushed their guard down and in, you know, or to the side, and then you've got all those techniques that come across. So, yeah. It seems a like a welcomed on. addition to Wing Chun, some of these techniques. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's why it yeah. seems to it seems to have stemmed from the same source, the way the, 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 the stance is held. Even though the stance is different, Lung Ying's a lot lower and a longer stance, but the mm-hmm. movement, 
is the same. From the Nutma training, you can still move forward. You know, you step forward very quickly without changing legs, if you know what I'm saying. Because if you've got your left foot forward, you can just shoot yeah. forward in three steps with still having your left foot forward. Whereas a lot of the and other styles step through from the, the back leg steps through. You mm-hmm. still see that triangle step too, right? Um, by triangle step, you mean the Nutma yeah, training? Stepping through, yeah. Yeah. Like the same so one we, we see in a lot of, a lot of Wing Chun. Yeah, so we use that nut ma uh, as the fundamental training ste- stepping in our classes to get that that coordination of the the hip power through to the hands because yeah that's where that's where it's all at isn't it and that's what Barry's showing us all in in class all the time about how you can take the force as long as your hips are backing it up if you get the timing wrong and the and the hip goes first or the hand goes first the timing's out it, it won't work. Right. That's so cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, like it's for me, it's really interesting to be able to talk to someone about lunging and, and Wing Chun because, you know, that's that's what we learned. Um, mm. It's really, really cool for for me to to talk with you, guys, you know, with you about this. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's fun. Yeah. So that was 93 when all that was going down. Um, and then um, 95, um, we had our. Um, Australasian Kung Fu Championships and um, Grandmaster Chung used to run that and I went in the welterweight division in that one and um, was able to use the the, the Nut Ma and the Wing Chun stances and, and techniques. We can't use the exact techniques because they used to make us fight with boxing gloves and amateur boxers headgear on. Right. Um, so you couldn't use a chain punch and all that but uh, I found that um, quite interesting because was the force from the hips I was still able to get it through. Yeah. Oh, and good. It worked really well. It was that was the first time I'd really tested it in um, full contact combat, so that was good. That's good because yeah, was it just other Wing Chun schools you were fighting with there, or were, were you see other nah, styles as well? No, nah, it was just all open to all styles. Yeah, mm-hmm. all styles. It was yeah. quite interesting. There was guys doing spinning hook kicks, you know, trying to land them on the back of the neck and all sorts of stuff. My division, I mostly had Wing Chun people, but it, yeah. It, there was a lot of kicking and sort of kickboxing type punching because of the, the equipment they made us wear, which was for safety, of course. Yeah. If you and, do full uh, contact winch and fighting, you'd have a lot of injuries. Yeah, and it can be difficult to be able uh, to be able to adapt, you know, to headgear and to gloves when you're not used to training with that kind of stuff. Yeah, it was. <laughs> Absolutely. I hadn't done full contact before. I never forget that first blow that landed on my head. So it just lit me up. I was like, whoa, this is fair. I can get going. Yeah. yeah. It was a bit of fun. Yeah, so I got through that. I was able to win my weight division in that. And then the next year, we had a um, another um, Australian tournament, and I entered the Chisau, um competition. And that was different again because what it was was um, it had like a, a headgear that had a shield. Um, like a like a grilled face mask to protect you, protect you because there was no gloves, of course, because you were doing chi cell. And mm-hmm. again, it was full contact. So they put um, they put Taekwondo body protectors on us, which you'd be familiar with, uh-huh. um, a groin guard, mouth guard, and this and this headgear. And what we did was we got into double chi cell position and did three rollovers, one, two, three, and then it was just go for it, score a technique, and uh-huh. it, and it was and it was points. So the first clear shot got a point and uh, that was a bit of fun i got through the um rounds and got to the final and i was up against this guy and his timing was just impeccable and if you got to three zero you won otherwise it was first to five points i'll never forget this guy he just he's, he'd roll one two three and bang he got me whack um clean hit i was like geez so good don't let that happen again next roll over one two three bang got me again he actually punched me in the throat below the head guard and i was made me a bit angry so I thought I've got to mix it up here. This guy's, you know, he get the, his next point he's one three zero. So <laughs> the next time we rolled over one two three, I just kind of just hooked my hands around his cheese cell position, and I just from cheese cell I roundhouse kicked him in the head with my right foot. <laughs> and oh my god! Bang one point, and because no one's expecting a kick, because of the wool shield training, I could roundhouse kick at that distance. Oh wow! Um, and then uh, the next time I did the left kick, bang roundhouse to the head, and uh, yeah, in, in the end. <laughs> This poor guy is just looking at me like, what is going on? Because I wouldn't let his hands move and kept kicking him in the head. And uh, yeah, I end up, yeah, from Chisa. Yeah, I end up getting to five, five, five points to his two and won the match. So that was a bit of fun. <laughs> That's amazing. 
Wow. Yeah, that's a great that's story. Fun. Yeah, it was funny. A lot of the guys in the club th- thought it was funny at the time. And I remember Anne Peng saying to me, Scott, you always find a way to win. <laughs> I said, well, I was in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> it was really good. Yeah. That's um, cool. Uh, Did you get to talk with him after and say, like, oh, I bet you weren't expecting that, eh? Oh, yeah, a little bit. Of, cheers, mate. Thanks for that. Yeah, wasn't super friendly about it. I don't think he liked it. Oh, <laughs> too but, bad. Um, I didn't like getting punched in the throat, so that's that's life. Um, yeah, and then uh, 2000, I got my black belt with Barry. And um, one of the fun stories there is in the, the lead up to training, a lot of, as you know, going into it, getting your black belt, there's a lot of training beforehand. And that was when I experienced my first ever real knockout. I'd, you know, through all this years of martial arts, I've fought a lot of different people in full contact fights and the crazy kickboxing days in the garage and everything. And uh, I had to spare, spar Ann Pang in one of the training sessions. It wasn't my grading, thank goodness. And Ann's footwork is incredible. If you see the, the videos of her on the, uh, on the net, she moves around so well. And Every time I wow. throw a technique, she's always either beside me or behind me. By the time I've done it, I'm like, not today. I'm going to make contact with her hands and have a proper Wing Chun, you know, like move around with hand contact. So okay. bow, ready, guard up, start, bang. I move straight in, fast as I can, just trying to contact the hands. Next thing I know, it's all black and I'm on my knees. I'm like, what's going on? Blood in my mouth. And uh, Anne's looking over me going, Scott, are you okay? And I said, yeah, <laughs> turned out when I'd come in so fast, she'd just done like a little pivot tuntail punch and I'd just driven myself straight into it as well as her uh, good technique and experienced my first wow. ever knockout. So it was a Wing Chun punch that finally knocked me out. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, it was actually. It was good to experience it. So <laughs> so it's like it was like the perfect marriage of you coming in and then her like deflecting the technique and, and, uh, and punching. Yeah. Uh, just stepped aside. structure off. was in the best alignment. Uh-huh. Oh, just, just nailed me. Perfect. Didn't even see it. I don't. I also, remember was charging in to make contact and just all black. And I'd been hit heavily a lot of times, as, as I described earlier, with the seeing red and stars flashing and all that sort of stuff. But this was just pure black out. Fell to my knees. So, yeah, only ever time it's happened, and hopefully that's the last one. But yeah, and then got the black belt with Barry and been training and instructing since, trying to improve all these different techniques done a lot um scott you've done oh, I've, been, I've been making a list here we had we have judo go ju wushu kickboxing aikido and wing chun yeah and yep. um, and lung ying and la hop and lung ying yeah and and we have yeah <laughs> yeah and tai chi so, a lot of stuff oh my goodness so then i'm wondering since you since you practice a lot of stuff what is what is some underlying principles that you think um are true for all of the styles that you've practiced? I think true for all of them would be the importance of footwork and being stable and being able to deliver and absorb force. Mm. That's in everything that we practice. And it's also important, you know, when I'm teaching a class, that's the first thing we do is footwork, forward stepping, side stepping, nut ma. Yeah, and that's in all those arts. We actually practice, uh, I didn't mention it, but we also practice one of the forms from Choi Leifat called Kaldar. And that mm-hmm. was um, from an experience Barry had when he was in Hong Kong training with Wong Sun Lung, where he met a guy with, who did Choi Leifat and he had such evasive footwork. And because um, the techniques are circular compared to the straight line movements of Wing Chun, um, he, taught, he taught Barry that one form, which is, I'm not sure where it sits in their forms because they have many. But uh, I think the idea was it was it represents the style very well. It's got a lot of the um, main techniques in it, and even that the footwork so important when you throw those circular movements, you, the turning of the feet, the turning of the hips, all in coordination to get that power. So yeah, I think the legs and the footwork is really so important. Mm-hmm. And then yeah. you've got you, you've got all your different theories, as I touched upon before. Of course, we know about economy movement and center line theory, Ling Chun, and um, the hop off up with the gaining the inside inside position. Tai Chi about disturbing the balance. Mm-hmm. Um, the Lung Ying with the, the destroying of the guard. You know, only you have hands going straight through. So yeah, there's a lot. Wow. Okay. And so. For our, uh, go ahead, Dean. I was just going to say, is is uh, 
all these styles they, they, they have a lot in common and synergize in a sense like uh, you know their their strongest areas work well with each other um, and it seems like they're kind of from the same region in China as well uh, you know I, I've heard a lot of the southern southern China area where a lot of these styles come out and you see other styles with similar philosophy like southern praying mantis yeah I think you're right I think they're mostly southern styles. Mm -hmm. and they're just all also uh, involved it's um it's it's hard to, that's why i don't really practice the young style tai chi form anymore because you can only get good at so much so barry sort of taught us to really cherry pick the the ones that matter and that, that work in case you ever have to use them because yeah there's been times where i, where I have had to use it because i'm in construction a manager I, I remember years ago i had a guy actually attack me on a job um, having an argument about you know, what he'd done and I wanted it pulled down and redone. And uh, he just rushed in and tried to punch me and I, I just put my guard up in Wing Chun stance and just stepped forward into the Wing Chun guard. And just the guard, because it's locked into your body, like I said before, the skeleton, that just hit him in the nose and instant blood nose and teary eyes for him. And it's just luckily my boss was watching the whole thing and said, Scott, you didn't do anything, so I didn't get in any trouble. But yeah. Mm. The, way, the way these systems work, it's very efficient. You know, I saw his punch coming and I didn't even have time to throw and I just guarded up but because we move in. As soon as there's trouble, we move straight in. Uh, it, it did the job. Wow. Scott, um, what what do you uh, practice the most when you, you uh, practice Long Ying? Are there certain areas uh -huh. where you focus uh, more, more effort? Be because um, with the Long Ying, if you don't move the hands in coordination with the hip, if it's not coordinated, it doesn't work. So the most thing I do when I train uh, is nut ma, just up and down, nut ma, over and over and over. And then sup luk dung, minimum of three run-throughs because I find that you know, it takes that amount to get it nice and smooth when you finally get to a point where it feels coordinated and the upper body's relaxed. Um, and I know some tung, but I I probably only do that one or two times. It's mostly nut ma and sup luk dung, which is the basics because that, that's you know where it's at. You got to have those basics spot on. There's no use going too far. Too often I see people on the internet whacking the wooden dummy, you know, and I look at their stance and I think, what are you doing? You know, you <laughs> stand properly before you hit that thing. Yeah, <laughs> that's a really good point. You got to line up the strength, right? That's yeah. that's where the it's going to come from. Yeah. Because also, when you hit that dummy too early, if you haven't learned, which Barry taught us a long time ago, if you haven't learned how to relax your upper body, all you do are hitting it so hard with, with tension in your arms is putting energy back into yourself. And, yeah, you can gain internal bleeding, all sorts of things. So you've got to, you've got to know what you're doing with your wing chun before you hit it. And do you guys use the dummy for other styles as well or just still with your wing chun only? Only the wing chun. Only the wing chun. And it's, you know, it's only very, very late in your training. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Barry's got a dummy um, that was made by the same guy that made Ip Man's. He had it made when he was in Hong Kong in the seventies. So um, one of the guys, in fact, the guy I first sparred who introduced me to Barry's style, uh, Ian. He's a really good carpenter, and he's he makes them for us exactly from Barry's. Wow, that's cool, man. Yeah, well, it's, yeah. As you as you be aware, the angles have to be precise because uh -huh. you know when you. When you hit that dummy, Barry's got a video about it online, but that uh -huh. arm has to be at the right angle and it has to move the right amount so that when you do tons out to the arm, the power comes through your legs, locks the arm into the dummy, and then the dummy moves. And if that mm -hmm. angle's wrong and you do that tons out to a real person, instead of ending up on their center line, you might end up past their left shoulder, you know? Oh, okay. Does that make sense? Because about the angles? Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't know that about the... It's a bit the, of a calibration tool. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's why when you come into that dummy and attack it, that's why those arms are set on the angles they're on and why they move the amount they move. Because if it moves too far, it only moves, you know, what's it move? 10, 20 mil? Probably only 10 mil in the socket. Because that's all you need to get your punch through. And if you get used to moving your arm... 40 millimeters or something to the side, you'll be on the wrong angle for that center line attack. Oh, I see what you're saying. Does that make sense? That makes sense, yeah. Yeah. And that's why they only pull out a certain amount too. When you move in and tons out, the dummy, the 
the, the, the arm locks back into the socket, then the dummy flexes on its supports, and then when you turn the wrist and hook it back out, that's why it only pulls forward so far because you don't want to over pull either because then you turn your body too much on the return movement too. If you move into an opponent, tons out, put pressure on their guard, then you pull and strike, you only need to move it a little bit to get through. It's small, it's accurate movements. I'm really just learning this right now. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I'm uh, kind of a noob here, but that's making a, that makes a lot of sense. I was I've always wondered why isn't it just like why isn't the dummy just um, static? You know, it's moving so much. I thought yeah. that was an imperfection. No, no, no. It's specifically because when you hit an opponent's hand, it moves, and you only have to move it and a little bit to get a center line punch through. That's why uh, the dummy slides left and right. Did you know that, Dane? Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> I always talk about it to you. I always talk about how the dummy, you have to practice range. And, and yeah. uh, you know, and obviously the, the dummy's design itself was made in a way to complement the art. Like, uh, I know, like, the, the length of the leg is important, too. Uh, if the yeah. leg's out too far, a lot of dummies, the cheaper dummies, the legs stick out really far, and you can't actually practice a proper range because you get snagged up on the extra long leg. So it's mm -hmm. kind exactly of right. Yeah, that's exactly right, Dane. Yeah, it's no good if you get in the habit of stopping, you know, further from the opponent than when your center line punch is fully uh, sent out, doesn't reach. Yeah, that makes sense. So I learned something today. Uh, if any of our listeners didn't. You got at least one, Scott, so that's good. <laughs> you can go and practice that on your dummy tonight, Vito, after we're done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's yeah, a bit so too late to do it now. It's because it's pretty loudy, so it's like 9.30 here. I'll, I'll teach you another tomorrow. trick. Put a little duct tape around the arms, and it'll mute it. Okay. Uh, pull don't the, pull the, the arm out and just run a piece of duct tape around it. Yeah, you'll never even hear it. I like the sound. Yeah. I do too. I leave, I leave mine that way too. It doesn't feel the same if it doesn't make the noise. Yeah, and I suppose the other um, theory in our school is that um, we're keepers of history, so don't modify anything, you know, just keep it as you've been taught it. Mm -hmm. Because some of this um, stuff, oh, I don't, the Loho Buffer, I think it's close to a 1,000 years old. I'm, I'm not a history expert. I know one of your other podcasts was really good with all the history, but um, – uh, I think it's about a thousand years old, and Wing Chun is relatively new at the four hundred years old. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I do not modify. We just practice and try and keep it as pure as we can because it, it just seems folly to think that with our limited experience of um, you know a couple of hours a week or whatever you can fit in between work and family and everything else that you can make a better martial art than people who spent generations and upon generations developing the techniques and at stages it was a full-time job because it was warfare yeah mm -hmm. that in our opinion is just the, the arts there it works when you know the system don't change it i think i think the reason people think traditional martial arts are, are ineffective in a modern world are simply because people don't have the time today to become as good as the people who originally created them just like you said it, yes. We don't have the time in our day to practice the way these people used to practice in a time when you didn't have police officers to protect you and you had to take the money from your business back to your house or pick up pick up goods in another town and bring it back to your town to sell it. Mm. Yeah. These things were more valuable then, especially when there were no guns, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. So I think that's a nice theory, too, that we, you know, we're all keeping some history alive. Yeah, a lot of it. A lot of it is recovering it for a lot of us. You know, like uh, just getting to the point of being as good as our teacher is is hard. And and every generation sometimes things get lost, and, and that's really that's really a shame for for the art and for the longevity of the art. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I know. I know that. Um, well, Sigung used to say that he, he. I can't remember the percentage, but it was low. It was only like thirty percent of Lam You know, like. And he was amazing. So I can't imagine what Lamu Guai must have been like. Yeah. It's like a, there's like this watering down that happens, right? From yeah. teacher to student, right? So only a few students will, or may, um, you know, be able to get the whole system and, and a really good understanding of it. Yeah, our previous guest, guest uh, Keith Mazza, mentioned that. And he said that the ultimate goal of the teacher is, is to produce students that exceed the ability of the teacher. Mm-hmm. That's a good phrase, yeah. It's 
it, but as you say, it's very hard. There's more, the more time goes on, the more distractions there are. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, I know uh, we wanted to we wanted to kind of keep this one around forty five minutes. Um, so Scott, we can wrap up here. Thank you. you. Like. It's been fun. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Yeah, it's been great having you on. Uh, it's and it's been it's been really nice hearing about your history and and your perspective with with Wing Chun. Yeah, no, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, and so for our listeners, that if they want to find you and and uh, and learn more about you, how can they do that? Uh, Barry Pang Kung Fu. There's a website there, so yeah, just check that out. Cool. Yeah, just Google Barry Pang Kung Fu. Then uh, yes, yeah. find you. Yep. Okay, great. We've had uh, Scott Peterson today. He's an instructor with with Barry Pang and in Melbourne, Australia. Thanks for coming on, uh, Scott. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Vida. All right. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Wing Chun Discussion Podcast. Log on to wingchundiscussion.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. More episodes are available on iTunes, Google Podcasts, and Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts.